Evolve and Ascend. I think we are live now. So welcome everybody to uh, session four of PKD Valis and Practices of Ultra Metacognition um, with Richard Doyle from Penn State. We, this is our fourth class and we've decided to take over Evolve and Ascend this week and broadcast to you the mind and consciousness of Philip K. Dick and Ubik. So tonight's class, we'll be, ta we'll be talking about Ubik. Um, if you haven't read the book, we recommend you read it. Uh, you're welcome to tune in with us anyway and kind of riff on the nature of consciousness and Philip K. Dick and um, how reading in literature is kind of an act of gnosis, is kind of a contemplative and spiritual experience. I had just wrote an article for Evolve and Ascend about this, so it's good timing. Um, and I will link to that article in the comment section for everybody listening. But um, awesome. I don't want to ramble too much. I just want to welcome you, uh, Richard. Welcome back to week four. And uh, please do take it away. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I really like to, I'm going to, I look forward to reading that article you've just written about, uh, you know, the, the act of, you know, the radical act of reading as an instance of gnosis. And I, I really think it's true. It may, it, it may not have always been true, right? You know, it may be that the intensity of the experience of reading goes up and down historically, depending on what, you know, medium we're in relationship to, right? For example, I always have this pet theory that meditation really bursts out at moments that new information technologies come online and create the conditions of overload that make people want to shut down that internal chatter. And, you know, part of it is of course, you know, when, you know, uh, Plato is writing in ancient Greece or when the Buddha, you know, is teaching uh, that you are, you're having cultures that are becoming literate. And because they're becoming literate, we can imagine that the internal self-referential narrative, our internal talk uh, that always seems to be about us is affected by that experience, but right? it's affected by that just increased order of magnitude of information processing that you're doing. And that I, I, you know, I, I've always been fascinated by the fact that, for example, Socrates did not write. And I think that one of the reasons he may not have written was not simply just because, you know, he couldn't write, but because, um, you know, in these experiences of new information technologies, which for Socrates writing was a new information technology coming online, they create this crisis in human consciousness. And they, they put us into this Darwinian situation where we have to engage other domains of consciousness in order to somehow avoid the impasse of being bombarded by all this new information that they're not used to. And then the culture builds it into the infrastructure and it becomes this kind of like ordinary goes without saying like level of consciousness that everybody's reading all the time and so forth. And then boom, some sort of twist happens as has happened, you know, in the past, you know, 18 years or so where the sheer amount of information that starts bombarding the ecosystem that we live in is you know doubling at you know every eighteen months just to eyeball it, and um, that our brains are therefore and our minds and our uh, acts of consciousness are in this relationship to that, and they're seeking kind of like ways out of the incessant internal narrative that happens when you're more or less being tweeted at, right, all the time by by an economy that is making its money not unlike the economy in Ubik actually making its money off of the attention of the participants, right? That, that economic value is generated by leveraging the uh, mental bandwidth of human beings, which I think is important that we should return to that. Um, so, so I think that right now, you know, one of the most interesting radical things you can do is to read a book that is essentially about that. <laughs> You know, that, that is about the competing bandwidth. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the competing bandwidth of uh, Buster Friendly and Mercer, you know, that, that Isidore realizes that they're competing for the minds of the, uh, of the uh, citizens, these, these two attentional bandwidths, so Buster Friendly or Mercer, the empathy handles on one hand and 25 hour a day, um, you know, consumption essentially on the other. And I wanted to encourage us to think that like part of what's fascinating and, and compelling about Dick's writing is that he's always pointing us beyond those apparent opposites, beyond those apparent uh, alternatives and seeing you know, that we can experience uh, different aspects of reality 
uh, simply by you know following along his creation of a fictional world, which are both eerily familiar and you know utterly you know odd and uncanny. So, uh, candy choosy competition over consciousness, right? And then this week we have you know inertials and precogs, right? Telepaths and inertials that uh, open people who are opening up the space of consciousness and people who are blocking the space of consciousness and that they're doing so in the service of a business model, right? That they're looking to uh, one way or another kind of buy into the bandwidth of human consciousness from the perspective of say Glenn Rutsitter's company, then, you know, they're running commercials suggesting that maybe your thoughts are not your own, right? And those commercials, it's really beautiful if you just go slowly enough, right? You get this idea from a commercial that your thoughts are not your own. <laughs> and then you act to give economic value to the company sponsoring that commercial. And of course it's true, your thoughts are not your own. That's proved because you're responding to a commercial which planted that seed into your mind. So indeed your thoughts are not your own. Um, and so, and that's being exploited because you can, because uh, because it's very difficult to prove a negative, you know, is somebody in fact, you know, borrowing some of my bandwidth is the idea. And then of course the precogs are gonna be more familiar to us, you know, living in the kind of capitalist society that we do. Whereas, you know, we, we, it sounds so extraordinary and, you know, unusual and so forth that you would have a business devoted to uh, trying to anticipate the future. But of course, that's exactly what Wall Street is, right? Wall Street is precisely this ongoing battle to uh, kind of articulate, understand, prophesize, and make the future happen, um, you know, in, even in so far as, you know, you're buying and selling futures contracts to sell certain things in the future at a certain price. Um, so this, what seems really odd because it relies on a kind of mad talent that even though we might have a sneaking suspicion that people have this capacity in differential, uh, you know, ways that, you know, it's not, we don't think of it as a business that you could buy and sell uh, telepathy or you could buy and sell precognition or you could buy and sell the capacity to block those things. Uh, but once we take a step back, we can see that in fact, this is not unusual at all. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, Dick's worlds really re resonate with us. I think the verb uh, that we should think about is resonate because it's, my, my, my kind of hypothesis for the evening would be that, you know, one of the things that we experience uh, when we read a Philip K. Dick novel is the uh, gradual dissolution between the experience of our own world and the experience of the world that is rendered in the novel. And we, we, we've, we've dealt with this before, but it's this experience of the boundary between the domain of the novel and the domain of uh, a human consciousness as becoming kind of indiscernible. You can no longer sort of tell you know, where one begins and another one ends. And I think if any of them is the most like that, the most productive of this experience of indiscernibility, and there probably isn't, but if there were one, it would probably be Ubik. And so I want to talk a little bit tonight about how uh, paying attention to the way PKD works with thermodynamics can sort of help us see how that resonance works. And that in a very strange way, even though people are wearing beanies and snoods and pedal pushers uh, and, you know, the most fantastically preposterous garb that perhaps has ever been assembled in characters in a novel. And we'll talk more about that as well, even though that is all so uncanny and strange. And it doesn't even seem like people could walk around in some of the, art, the articles of clothing that they're allegedly wearing. Right. And so absurd and hyperbolic that this is a deeply realistic piece of fiction, uh, meaning that uh, it works through kind of its own, dis that, that any disappearance, any uh, distinction between itself and the world that we live in kind of vanishes, even as people are, as I've seen, you know, wearing beanies and pedal pushers and snoods, oh my, right? Um, and so I want to try to figure out like why that might be. So the, the title I'm working under here is just leveraging thermodynamics with ultra metacognition. And then hopefully we'll get to this sense of 
orthogonal time. I know we'll get to the sense of orthogonal time. We'll get to this way that Ubik not only stages, that is, talks about, shows happening in the novel, some kind of a time distortion that is going on, right? But it doesn't only represent that in the novel, that it actually can induce a time distortion in the individual, collective of individuals that are re reading the book. And how it does that, um, and this idea of orthogonal time that PKD, um, uh, you know, will muse on in response to his writing of Ubik is, uh, you know, where I want to go. So, um, Jeremy, do you have the uh, notes that I sent you from uh, the Kindle notes that I had from the exegesis that are on Ubik? There were two different slides. There were screens for uh, clippings.io. Yes, let me get that up on the screen. Yeah. Let's see. It's this gonna, one first. Yeah, I think uh, that's it right there. Okay. Okay, um, make it bigger. There you go. So intriguingly, you could probably find this just by searching for the keyword exegete, um, the verb form of, uh, for the exegesis, right? Um, and I wanted to point to this because... Um, you know what? What, I've, what I think is important to do is to contextualize uh, PKD's novels insofar as they involve what we've been talking about for the uh, weeks past and continuing into the future. This experience of multi of ultra metacognition, this experience of being able to observe ourselves, observing ourselves think, and when we observe ourselves, observing ourselves think, we have to reflect back and see who is this that is thinking. And it's an experience that you can have, and it's an experience which has uh, much to recommend it. And it seems to be an experience that evolution is pushing us to have right now, uh, apropos the increased bombardment of information I was mentioning about 10 minutes ago, that we're being pushed to that space that Aurobindo and I guess Gebster also you know, call integral consciousness, right? Where we don't simply identify with the flow of events that are occurring or the flow of thoughts that are occurring in us, which have become too many, too much, and all at once, but instead identify with that which can observe those flow of thoughts and those uh, flow of ideas and that flow of information. And so uh, musing on this, uh, PKD writes in the exegesis, he says, it's all there in Ubik, could I exegete? Meaning, uh, I think from the kind of refrain that he's coming back to quite often in the exegesis, um, both in the you know print version that we have and the full text of it that's available at zebrapedia.psu.edu, um, that uh, you know, Ubik is a frequent site of exegesis itself. In other words, in some ways, the exegesis is a response that PKD makes to trying to understand Ubik. The exegesis is his attempt to understand how this book works and what it does and really what it's about. So if we could go to the next one then, Jeremy, we can look at some of what he says there. And I think that this should situate our reading, you know, it doesn't have to like, I know, like how there's a reflected lamp in there. Um, certain anomalies occur, which prove to whoosh, the characters that their environment uh, is not real. In one of my novels, you have certain anomalies occur, which prove to the characters which their environment is not real, which is really something worth musing on, right? Um, uh, that it's in this uh, observation of one's own environment as somehow not real that the experience of metacog ultra metacognition can occur. So I mentioned a week or so ago, uh, this short distilled text uh, that PKD um, wrote in 1978, I believe, uh, Cosmogony and Cosmology, uh, which was a kind of distilled treatment of the exegesis to, up to that point. And it was spurred by a response that he was giving to a student who had sent him a paper that they had written about his work, which I thought was beautiful. And the essay begins, as to, be re as to reality being a projected construct, right? very first sentence, 
So there's this sense in which PKD is both acting out and asking us to carry out what he calls an ethical balking, he calls it, a kind of um, pausing and saying, now, wait a minute. Is all of this stuff that is around me like actually real? And he does that by staging that in characters who are experiencing the same problem, right? In other words, so in Android, do Android do an electric sheep? Isidore can't tell whether something is a machine or a life form, neither can Deckard, right? So there's a kind of crisis in uh, deliberation there in terms of what is real, what is alive. And then in, of course, Three Sigmata, Palmer Eldritch, we have, you know, the, the possibility that A, you know, is the world of Candy actually real or, you know, is it simply a projection and the, the Havilists disagree about this? And then, of course, the world of Chu Z, is it real or is it the product of uh, Palmer Eldritch's imagination? Now, this might seem a kind of like trivial worry that, you know, we ought to just get over and say, okay, like, whatever, like, it's basically real. This is the only world that you know. Like, what are you worried about? Um, but what I think is uh, interesting in this uh, passage from the exegesis here is that um, Dick follows up and says, by my own logic of the novel, I must conclude that my or perhaps even our collective environment is only a pseudo environment. And here, you know, PKD is in accord with Vedanta, for example, that, you know, the, most of the Sanskrit tradition, Plato, um, that is saying, hey, you know what? We're living in this world of our senses that we take to be real, but our senses and our language that we use to describe that sensory experience and our cognition that we use to understand that, sempre, that uh, sensory experience, these are all really just maps of reality. And in those maps of reality, things seem to come and go, or in the world of Ubik, things seem to degrade. They don't seem to have really be substantial. And so in that sense, uh, the stakes are very high indeed, because if PKD is right, that perhaps even our collective environment is only a pseudo environment, then we need to look and see what it is about our awareness that allows us to perceive that. In other words, if our environment that surrounds us and seems to come and go, seems to not be substantial, seems to be a rapidly escalating, accelerating news cycle that does not uh, uh, you know, really begin to make any sense, which we could write parts of it on different, on a matchbook cover and not you know, connect the dots a la characters in, a, uh, in Ubik, um, that you know, we can begin to look for what it is that makes us realize. And in fact, this is all just shadows on the wall, pace Plato in the allegory of the cave. And this is, of course, exactly what PKD is talking about in the short distilled piece, Cosmology and Cosmog Cosmogony. I always forget which goes first. Um, and, and which starts as to reality being a, a projected framework what he's suggesting in that, I really uh, would suggest that you uh, uh, read that piece. It's, a, it's available online and it's available in the uh, Selected Literary and Philosophical Writings. I have a short, overly uh, exegetical article that I could share with the group on it. It's, um, it's painstaking in working through some of the uh, passages. But the point would be is that PKD comes to the conclusion that both he and Jacob Bohm the uh, German cobbler who experienced uh, uh, an illumination similar to PKD's reported illumination by Vallis through the reflection of light off of a pewter dish. So again, a kind of flash and light, what he called the blitz, that both of them were seeing through the suffering of ordinary experience, which is unreal, and experiencing what Bohm called the Urgrund, right, the baseline of reality. So uh, if we could go a little bit further down there, Jeremy, we can look and see. Um, yeah, the next one. I still maintain that there is some scientific principle in Ubik, which I thought was fiction, but which is either a new discovery or more likely a rediscovery of one discarded long ago. Ubik, the force itself, 
Ubik would roughly correspond to the universal imminent mind, which Virgil mentions. Not only does it animate the universe and cause it to work, but since each of us is a piece of the universe, more properly the cosmos, as Pythagoras called it, each of us has inside him a spark of that universal mind. And uh, elsewhere, uh, PKD will describe our relationship to the cosmos in this way as being a bit of the hologram, right? That we are a part of the whole. And the interesting thing about a hologram, as you probably know, but which I'll rehearse, is that a hologram, if you take if you take a photograph, an ordinary photograph, and you get the film for the photograph and you cut a piece out of it, well, now the picture has a hole in it. And the other piece is just a picture of a small part of the picture. If you do the same thing with film that is based, uh, that is part of a hologram, uh, it will be blurrier, but you can shine a laser through it and it will contain the whole picture. The part is the whole, the part contains the whole, the part recapitulates the whole. The part is imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, to the whole. And so uh, what Dick is pointing to here in, uh, you know, when he says that, hey, you know, in Ubik, I've rediscovered something uh, that is in fact, that other, many other people have pointed to, which is what he says, this imminent mind, which Virgil mentions. Not only does it animate the universe and cause it to work, but since each of us is a piece of the universe, then uh, that each of us has inside him a spark of that universal mind. And so I think that's really worth pausing on because when we read a book by like Ubik, which leverages thermodynamics, as I said, you know, and really, to me at least, gave me the experience of just seeing entropy everywhere. You know, uh, Lindsay posted, you know, an image from one of the original covers of uh, Ubik, I think I recognized the spray can, and um, said a lot of entropy this week. And that's one of the things that Ubik does. That's why I'm calling it such a hyper-realist fiction. It makes us notice all the entropy that is in our environment. And it can even convince us that somehow there's more entropy in our environment now than usual. Um, but of course, what you know, Ubik the novel is really doing there then is really demythologizing the story that we're telling of ourselves, that are telling ourselves that we don't live in a world of uh, entropy, that we don't live in a world where energy is constantly, the second law of thermodynamics says that energy is constantly dispersing, basically. And so that this experience we have of being an orderly being, a living system, an aware system uh, in, uh, you know, on a planet, of being an orderly being within an environment which itself obeys the second law of thermodynamics, is itself kind of careening constantly towards entropy. Then we can sort of see this kind of this crosshairs that PKD is constantly pointing to the crossover between entropy and consciousness, which he'll call uh, in the exegesis and in Vallis negentropy after the work of the great um, uh, Austrian physicist and biologist Erwin Schrodinger, who uh, uh, coined the term negentropy uh, in his 1943 publication, What is Life?, which is the text that actually then gives rise to molecular biology and biotechnology and so forth. But the point here is, is that when we begin to notice all this entropy in our environment, at first it can seem very dire indeed, right? It can seem like all the cigarettes in the world are stale. It can seem like all the milk in the world is, is sour. Um, it can seem uh, periodically, as it does to me, that we're certainly going retrograde uh, in time in many ways, right? You know, in other words, somebody said to me the other day that, that they were a medievalist. Uh, and I said, well, you know, aren't we all basically because the idea that there's re that really very much in an archetypical way has changed in the past 2000 years is what I really think, you know, which I recognize goes well beyond the medieval period. But I think what PKD was pointing to when he would say the empire never ended, you know, really We've had all this technological progress. We've had all this increase in our ability to use knowledge to manipulate the external world. But really, you know, what exactly has changed? And maybe have we gone backwards? Have we got degraded a little bit, in fact? You know, so I talked about Marjorie Kemp last week as, you know, 15th century woman who um, 
had visions, some of them not unlike those reported by uh, PKD, and absolutely nobody diagnosed her as insane, right? There was no psychiatric medical establishment waiting to label her. Of course, there was a church hierarchy that found some of what she was doing uh, uh, distressing, but there was also a church hierarchy that found what she was doing you know, intriguing. So part of what Ubik does for us is it makes us notice, A, how the environment really is full of sour milk and stale cigarettes and noise and what PKD will call in Duenner's River Electric Sheep, kipple, right? Just disorder. But in the heroic quest of the characters, if you will, they always have to discover the fact that there is something in them that recognizes that, which is really fascinating. And that that something in them that recognizes that does not itself seem to be subject to entropy in the same way. It seems to observe entropy, but not be affected by it in the same way. So that would be the imminent mind which Virgil mentions. Not only does it animate the universe and cause it to work, so the principle of order in the universe itself, that why there are living beings, why, there, why this is an orderly universe with physical laws, for example, would be this idea of the logos, which is imminent or implicit in the universe, and not simply a construct that human beings are throwing over the universe, but an attribute of the universe. Um, and that each of us, more importantly, has inside them a spark of that universal mind. That each of us are bits of that universal mind. And that when we have an aha moment of some kind, a little e enlightenment moment, as um, uh, a book, um, What Enlightenment Does to Your Brain by uh, Andrew, somebody will remind me the name. I've taught the book many times, but his name is Space. I'm having a little bit of entropy. And uh, that they call the little enlightenment moment, this aha moment is that experience of each of us having a spark of that universal mind, that we're able, that we find the universe periodically intelligible because A, it is intelligible, and B, it is intelligible precisely because we have this, we are a way of observing the intelligible patterns in the universe. That's what consciousness is. So rather than being some kind of weird, separate, kind of latecomer to the universe, we are a manifestation in this view that Dick is describing here of the universe as having mind imminent to it, meaning the universe is already conscious and that we're a way for the universe to be conscious of itself. And that's what is detailed even uh, further in cosmogony and cosmology. But what role does thermodynamics have to play in that? Well, it seems to me when we're thrown into these worlds that are degrading, when reality itself is degrading in the world of Ubik, right? Reality itself, is kind of no longer real in the world of Ubik. And it becomes undecidable which world is real. We can periodically root for one world being real, the world of Joe Chip being in Cold Pack or the world of Glenn Rutzner being in Cold Pack. But the novel leaves it essentially undecidable. And in that kind of undecidable uh, zone, then uh, we are asked to sort of find some kind of larger scale that would make, make sense of this. And part of the thing that makes sense of it is this perspective on entropy of saying like, we can notice that we live in an entropic world, but we have this capacity to observe and cognize entropy that itself does not feel entropic. So, uh, and that's that spark of the universal mind. So in contact with all this entropy, it's almost as if we're forced to look inside and see if there's something that transcends that entropy. Because we have a desire to transcend that entropy. We have a desire for the characters to transcend that entropy. Where does that desire to transcend entropy come from? And Dick is going to say that that desire to en transcend entropy in the form of imminent mind is actually an aspect of the universe and that we can transcend that entropy uh, at the moment, right, 
that we engage in ultra metacognition when we can say a sentence like, I know that I am observing samsara. So samsara being the Buddhist word, of course, for uh, the Sanskrit word for the kind of conflict of ordinary linear time and reality. Samsara is a humanoid robot floating to the ceiling and exploding. Samsara is uh, milk turning sour. Samsara is a stale cigarette. Samsara is a tape recorder that not only the tape is degraded, but all the parts are worn out, right? That's samsara. Uh, and we can sort of panic in the face of samsara and say, oh my gosh, not only is everything impermanent, but it's kind of the degradation of it is accelerating. Uh, but we can also turn our awareness back on ourselves, which I'm always asking us to do. And imperience the fact, as Franklin Merrill Wolf would say, imperience the fact that there's something within me that allows me to know that. Allows me to know that samsara is this one level of reality where everything is coming and going and everything is living and dying and everything is dust to dust, stale cigarette to stale cigarette. But we must therefore have something to compare it to. We must have some sense inside of us that there is something beyond. Now, it's possible that we're just deluded, right? Uh, you know, that in fact, there is nothing inside of us that transcends uh, that samsara. But there's only one way to find out, and that is to engage in this radical act of interception. I'm looking and seeing, as Piketty, is it true that each of us has inside of them a spark of that universal mind? And if we don't, what is the basis by which we are differentiating this ongoing entropy that is all of our lives, this ongoing samsara that is all of our lives, and some internal space of strength and peace, which is, allows us to not identify with that stream of suffering, right? But to observe it. And now you might say, I can even feel somebody saying, oh, but if you don't identify with that world of suffering, you won't care about it. And that's not true at all, right? In other words, that, you know, Glenn Runster may very well not, you know, identify with what is happening to Joe Chip, but he can still, you know, have compassion for it. Um, we can have compassion for somebody who's, you know, making repetitious mistakes over and over and over again, even while we don't make those mistakes ourselves. So we can just level up our awareness a little bit and observe what happens in entropic situations. So I just stepped in some dog shit, let us say, right? And I can either identify with that situation and say, oh, the world is a malefic you know, you know, maleficent place that's trying to put dog shit on my foot, right? Or I can observe that, yeah, you know what? Every now and then, kind of awareness that I am, I'm going to step in dog shit and I can observe it and laugh and kind of respond to that and not make a story out of it. Like, because I, I can very quickly begin to make a story and saying, oh my gosh, you know, the milk is sour, the cigarettes are stale. And what happens? We become devastated. We, 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 become, we become, begin to identify with the entropy. We begin to think that the entropy is the only real thing about the universe. We secretly think that the negative, for example, is more real than the positive. Our brains overvalue positive information, uh, negative information to positive information on a five to one ratio. You can look to Gary Weber's website, Happiness Beyond Thought, uh, and you can Google or put in the search box appropriate terms there, positive information, negative information. You'll see there's, you know, there's, good, there's good literature on this. And so we secretly think when we read a book like Ubik, we say, ah, oh, yeah, that's how it is. We're just, you know, we're just subject to the you know, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Uh, but in fact, you know, the reason why the book is called Ubik and the reason why there's a salvation there is that it's precisely where we're in the maw of thermodynamics, we're in the maw of entropy, when we feel like samsara is about to crush us the most, that we're forced to look within. We're forced to keep the old swizer up, Joe, which I think is the, or is it swizzer, the note that he gets, you know, from Ubik, and find our internal strength. 
And when we do that, we can discover that we, each inside of us, there is that spark of the universal mind. Or at the very least, that the fiction that PKD is writing is just as effective at soliciting that spark of the universal mind within us as it is at soliciting that sense of uh, samsara and a world subject constantly to the second, to the second law of thermodynamics. Um, so it feels like um, that, you know, rep, you know, representation of a world as being subject to a kind of accelerated thermodynamic decay becomes hyper-realist for us because what it does is it focuses our attention the way in which those forces are always already operating in our environment but which our internal self-referential narrative kind of deletes or edits. So for example, we know in some kind of a, a, a conceptual way that death is a part of our environment, that death is in fact an attribute of life. It's not the opposite of life. It's you know, part of you know, the deal that we've got here, right? That which is born Na jayate miryate va karashit nayam bhutva abhavita va na buya. I believe that's, you know, you know, that which is born dies, right? It doesn't, you don't get to be born without dying. It's a, it's a kind of, you know, there's a non-dual relationship there that life and death are not opposites, but are, you know, attributes of each other. So um, we know that to be the case, but of course, in our own internal self-referential narrative, that is something that happens to other people and that is something that is going to happen later, right? So that's the story that we always have. And if we investigate our own experience, I think we'll find that. Um, and so what Ubik is doing is making us, in fact, go within and see, like, well, is this unchanging aspect of ourselves really subject to birth and death, right? Or is its characteristic as unchanging that which allows us to see, perceive all the change that we see in samsara and the entropic world, what Aurobindo would call prakriti, right? Just where everything changes all the time, you know, it's where we live. Um, and that we can learn to identify with that unchanging aspect of ourselves rather than with the ongoing change is I think the kind of situation that Ubik puts us into and why it can dissolve the boundary between the world and the book. Because in the book, we see that the, everything is getting sour, everything is wearing out. And then it lights up our awareness so that when we're walking around, we start to notice the entropy that our internal self-referential narrative had up to that point, you know, doing as good of a job as possible to edit out. So um, what we have to ask there then is, you know, who is it who observes uh, this breakdown in reality? Who is it that observes the entropy? And this is going to be the question that PKD will want to ask in Vallis, right? You know, uh, who is horse lover fat? Who is Phil? What kind of awareness is it that observes the um, ongoing linear time dissolution of uh, thermodynamic systems in linear time? That's what causes the appearance of linear time, right? The thermodynamic systems are irreversible. Entropy tends towards dispersal, right? So it's, it's much easier to break something than it is to create something, right? You can't. And so if we'll do that, and here's where we're getting to the exegesis and then I'll pause. If we'll do that, if we'll look and see what is this capacity that can observe the ongoing decay that is subject to what we usually call, what that, that reality, what we usually call reality is subject to, who is it that's observing that, you know, then uh, we can experience the unchanging and experiencing the unchanging. We experience what PKD will call orthogonal time, which is the time that is at right angles to linear time, linear time going on, right? So going to Luna, talking to Stanton Mick, humanoid robot, explosion, taking Glenn Rensseter to the, uh, Beloved Brethren Moratorium, that's linear time, okay? Um, but orthogonal time is the perspective that is in fact experiencing eternity and observing the unfolding of 
exactly the universe is not out to get us not even remotely it's it's holding us in fact it's just teaching us with entropy to find neg entropy and if we'll go if we'll activate our search engine for neg entropy you know then we're activating ubing so we'll go to some text uh after a few questions but i thought i'd pause right there and see if there's any questions about that or you know comments or responses to that first 45 minutes i wasn't able to see a lot of the uh chat flow uh because i was you know lost in my own logos uh so you know if you've already said something that you want to underline or uh, um, illuminate please do all right yeah we do have quite uh, a chat box today um Let's see, just some observations like the um, the papes Dan is mentioning. They yeah. seem very much like Google, an idea that an idea that's there even in the 1950 stories. Uh, should read Homeo Papes, though maybe there was a Romeo Papes subgenre. Interesting. Um, well, well, it's it's so interesting. I, I find it so interesting the combination of the futuristic and the archaic that. You know, yes, you can dial gossip and interplan news, but it's done in the form of, you know, a newspaper at the same time that even in all of his prescience, PK Dick, uh, PKD is still imagining us working in the same medium, more or less, as we did before, as opposed to, for example, this medium that we're engaging here. Now, other places, you know, in Divine Invasion, there's this kind of haptic, this glyph slab iBook thing that's in there but yeah and so and that that would and that the proliferation of gossip and different forms of news that you can dial just for yourself was going to make you know help induce a reality crisis which of course we're perceiving right now yeah pay for more like twitter than google mm. Yeah, Dan uh, is also saying that we can't evolve if we're stuck in something that degrades. So the recogni recognition of the pseudo environment is a first step to a more evolved consciousness. Totally. Interesting that, that Ella and others supposedly discovered or invented Ubik in response to Jory's attacks. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. a great observation there. I had that as a question mark in my notes um, because Ubik seemed to be this kind of other metaphysical entrance you know, that, you know, it seems to be this kind of ubiquitous ad, but it ends up being this sort of metaphysical question. But then he mentions right at the end of the book, like, oh, you know, Ella helped develop this. So what what is that kind of participatory question? Where does that lead, you know? Well, but, you know, I think it's worth going to the one true commercial in the book, which is the beginning of chapter 17. Um which PKD will write elsewhere because he loved the German translation of this, um, where he says, uh, um, instead, well, I'll, I'll read it, and then we'll talk about the German translation. He says, I am Ubik. Before the universe was, I am. I made the suns, I made the worlds, I created the lives and the places they inhabit. I move them here, I put them there. They go as I say, they do as I tell them. I am the word, and my name is never spoken. The name which no one knows, I am called Ubik, but that is not my name, I am. I shall always be, you know, in the beginning was the word and word was Ubik and, the, and Ubik was with God, you know, uh, that the logos that and, and so but the German translation he loved because it said, I am the brand name. Uh, I am Ubik and I am the brand name because we can see that even in the contemporary situation, our need to uh, create these heralds, these brands that were still manifesting this imminent principle of the universe. So only reason I read that out, it's not so much that Ella invents it as she engages in ultra metacognition. Remember, she's trying to stay out of the bardo. Uh, she engages in ultra metacognition and discovers a principle that is already imminent to the universe. She discovers, as Tessa puts it, that the universe is not out to get us, but that it just appears in this pseudo environment that the universe is out to get to get us. But what PKD will call, you know, after boom, the Urgrund is trying to wake us up. And in trying to wake us up, it has to induce entropy in order for us to enter into self-awareness. So yeah, I think it's, it's, an, it's an evolutionary phenomenon that even now is taking place. And that, you know, we are participants in that evolutionary 
phenomenon taking place, but we're able to participate in it precisely because it's actually imminent to the universe. We don't need to feel like we're out there on our own. Like we're, we're on this quest. We have to do it. Joe Chip has to do it, but it's something that the universe has been doing forever. It is what the universe is. Uh, if I can put it that way, like, I, you know, I shall always be, that's the eternal. And it's only from this perspective of etern eternal time, you know, the, the now that is always happening, that we can then perceive this flow of linear time as being sort of, you know, just the waves on the surface of the ocean, as it were. And by being able to perceive the waves on the surface of the ocean, we can begin to perceive some of the patterns and we cannot identify with the waves, right? Um, and it seems to me that, you know, uh, that, so therefore, you know, Ella, just to make the point, Ella is rediscovering a principle that is always there. And so too, can we rediscover a principle that is already there? So good point. Yeah, there was also an interesting comment. Can't quite find the link to it right now, but um, the, the guy you're thinking of, Andrew Newberg, right? Ooh, the guy who wrote that book. Exactly. Thank you. It's based on his last name. He's in Philadelphia at um, Jefferson Medical School, where I spent many much time in my youth. Um, and his, I, I highly recommend particularly that book, um, just in terms of seeing that, look, you know, this is a, what we're calling here ultra metacognition. It's a real function of the brain that different cultures and different practices potentiate in different ways. But something is measurable that correlates to the experiences that people are have, whether they're doing, uh, Sufi dancers or whether they're meditation practitioners or whether they're engaged in prayer uh, and so on, that there are all different ways of doing it. And what we're doing here is looking and saying, hey, can an intensive reading of a book and then intensive collective experimentation in discussion about that book can it lead to this subtle, sudden dwindling of the Pareto lobe that Newberg writes about um, in What Enlightenment Does to Your Brain? And, and it sure feels like it does, like that those aha moments can occur. And you have enough of those aha moments, and then you're, next thing you know, you're inventing Ubik or you're, you know, you're helping share ultra metacognition. Yeah, there was one more science article somebody shared earlier, um, basically about a consciousness studies article looking at how the brain after death retains consciousness for a short period of time. And this is kind of a spooky, I don't know if the poster of this article knows that the timestamp for that article, but it would be kind of funny in syn synchronicity if this happened last week while everybody was reading Ubik about, you know, um, extending that kind of half life. 374 is what the... Uh article was timestamp. <laughs> wow, wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so Don is Don is mentioning about Donald, he's mentioning, didn't Philip talk about the pleroma from which we call, uh, which we emerge from and to which we return? Mm. And in fact, it's my suspicion that one of his uh, sources on this uh, is the uh, text that I've been uh, streaming uh, in my ear at night, which is called Against the Gnostics, and I'm spacing on the, uh, excuse me, Against Heresies, Irenaeus, um, which describes all the schools of Gnosticism and goes into great deal, a uh, great deal of detail on the Pleorama, but it could also just be Encyclopedia Britannica, because the Encyclopedia Britannica was pretty badass back then, um, so uh, I don't know, but um, the Pleroma would be uh, another name, I think, for Ubik and another name for what uh, Franklin Merrill Wolf called consciousness without an object. That, you know, this um, domain of consciousness, which we can access if we'll enter our own mind. Well, excuse me, uh, um, uh, ex, you know, empty our own mind of any content to consciousness and just experience consciousness without any content. Um, if you have trouble with that in meditation, you can always go to a flotation tank lab, uh, a flotation tank, and you, most people can achieve this state 
uh, which is why John Lilly was so interested in uh, Franklin Merrill Wolf's book uh, work that you know that we can experience this consciousness on an object, and rather than that just being a kind of like content of our minds, that that's actually that capital T out of which everything is emerges. What appears to be real to us, material reality, our lives, our apparent separateness, all these things are actually manifestations um, of pure consciousness, you know, happening, you know, in an eternal instant, which would be the pleroma, right? You know, that that would be that out of which we are an unfolding. Um, and one of the reasons precognition might be possible, right, is because everything is happening all at once. Um, according to that point of view, you can imagine sort of Gnosticism being more of a telepathy and precognitive friend, friendly way of thinking than, you know, materialism. Yeah. On that note, um, Dan was saying that I have, I haven't read all of his books, PKD, but this novel seems to come the closest to explaining the evolution of consciousness mm. that also produced the telepaths and the precogs and the whole psychic landscape of his future. Yeah, that's a great comment. And, you know, to your point, what you're saying is very interesting about the sort of ground of being that is out of time. And if you tap into that ground of being, if you return to that source, you get access to information that's outside of your linear time. So, yeah, it's very interesting that the, the, that psychics and telepaths and precogs seem to kind of permeate Philip K. Dick's imaginary science fiction landscape across so many of his books. Well, well, what becomes interesting there then is, you know, as you said, you know, you can, uh, instead of identifying with this, uh, you know, samsara, with this embodied existence, we can return to the ground of being. We can, we can tune into the Urgrund, as PKD put it in that uh, cosmogony and cosmology text, um, that we can get information from other places and times. And that's where, that's where it gets kind of interesting and tricky because um, that information, like in other words, by, by definition, we're in that state most fully when our consciousness is devoid of any content whatsoever, right? And so, but nonetheless, consciousness can then leak in because we lose our focus. Content can leak into that consciousness without an object. And when that occurs, it does seem to be the case that you can have access to ideas. You can, re you can, you can uh, know lines from Richard III by Shakespeare when you've never read Richard III by Shakespeare. Um, but it's very easy to get into a game where you're kind of trying to chase that and you're trying to query the information in that domain. And I think that that tends to be something that blocks our ability to access consciousness without an object because we're looking for something out of it and when we look for something out of it then we're not selfless and when we're not selfless we block the urgrund we block pleroma right you know uh Teilhard, you know which we talk about most every week now and which was you know will become really important when we go over the exegesis and valis um you know he talked about the fun fundamental necessity of ego death in order to experience, you know, Christ consciousness. And so uh, if we, we go in with some sort of a, a kind of even curiosity, even idle curiosity, and just instead of not knowing, you know, then that information might be skewed a little bit, right, by our own kind of egoic awareness. But it's definitely the case, you know, that if you don't identify with your local awareness and you experiment with what Hilly, uh, Lily called star maker, right? Consciousness without an object, then something interesting happens. Yeah, we're, we're linking everybody to Teilhard as well. Oh, uh, there's a link, uh, Teilhard, Feast of Saint. Feast Day of uh, Saint Arenas, <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah. That's who wrote um, Against the Heresies. Yeah, uh, somebody just found a link to the, both of them together, Saint uh, Saint Arenas and Terry. It must be the Omega Point. <laughs> yeah, there we it go. <laughs> oh, this is great, and also uh, Gepser, an ever-present origin, 
as another another word for this ground or pleroma. It's very interesting. Um, you just what's it call it? The ever present origin. I, I don't have the German translation, ah. um, but I, the title of is Ursprung und Gegenwart. Um, so one Gegenwart. of those is yeah Gegenwart. I, Against Gegenwart. Somebody will will translate that one. But somebody will. If Jen, yeah. if my buddy Jen is listening, <laughs> she'll probably correct me in my pronunciation. Uh, um, and I appreciate it. So if she's still around, maybe she can do that in the chat. But um, yeah. It, let's see if there's any other good questions for this thread here. So the only other thing that I thought was really interesting. Um, I was listening to a podcast, actually, you know, The Verge, um, they did a, the Ver Verge did a Vergecast podcast on Philip K. Dick and Ubik. Um, and I was listening to that just as to kind of get, take some more notes. And one of the questions was very simple. They were like, what is, what is this ultimately all about? We're talking about interesting literary narrative uh, um, styles and everything else, but what is the book really about? And I suddenly thought, you know, this is really, it's, the same theme as do androids dream it's the same theme as in the exegesis uh the interviews where he's talking about the logos and and the irrational the rational invading the irrational right and yeah. and moving against the forces of entropy to to kind of move to, to redeem the created universe to redeem time and it's just so interesting how he has a completely different linguistic set of ideas and symbols for this book and yet the underlying kind of archetype in his whole in his all of his writings is this kind of same impulse and which which brings and really brings to the point and brings home the exegesis and how how trippy it must have been for him to go look back at all of his books and kind of go oh wait all of these books are exploring this you know um uh, no uh, absolutely that, that the you know that you know, PKD is involved, you know, involved in heroic acts of introspection in the exegesis. And in those acts of introspection, you know, both in their magnitude and their depth and their persistence, um, he is discovering that what he is learning, he always already knew, right? He's discovering that it is imminent to him, that that divine spark was already operating in him but that he was not aware of it, was not available to his conscious awareness. And it was almost like when he's writing these novels, he's working out ways to bring it into narrative form and therefore into conscious awareness. Because, you know, as it says, you know, at the end of uh, Ubik, you know, I am the unnameable. I, I can't be put into language. I am the unfathomable. Right. No wonder the exegesis goes on for more than 8,000 pages, right? That you're not going to be able to put it into language. But that, you know, this really, uh, again, uh, to me, courageous uh, introspection that he's engaging in and looking at his own works, like, you know, he certainly likes his own books, but he's also just kind of engaging them as a critical reader and the sheer honesty. So if we go back to, um, uh, those um, notes, if we could go back to those notes that uh, uh, were my Kindle notes from the exegesis, he says uh, at a certain point, maybe maybe it's further down, um, or maybe it's the next one, he says, uh, not, maybe it's further up, not, not Ubik by Philip K. Dick, but Philip K. Dick by Ubik. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, can, I can share it, you know, maybe I didn't share the picture, but I can share it with, I'll share the uh, link with the group later. But it, it says that, and he's musing on this fact that, you know, it's less that he's writing Ubik than he's being written by Ubik. And so, uh, you know, this uh, idea that he's just rediscovering, like Ella is rediscovering something that is already imminent to the universe is, you know, a part of the long journey. We have to go we have to exhaust ourselves to find out that we already know, you know, the truth, but we can't just know the truth without exhausting ourselves. We have to actually go through the journey and discover the truth within ourselves. So, you know, a little bit of Joseph Campbell's spin on Philip K. Dick, but I think that thread that you laid out where he's constantly rediscovering 
the principle of the logos, you know, and then discovering the principle of the logos as having entered into him through Vallis, or at least representing it as, as entering into him through Vallis, that Vallis being a new name, really just a kind of postmodern science fiction name for the logos, the vast active living intelligence system as being the manifestation of this imminent mind understood from the point of view of kind of information technology, right? That a universe that could communicate itself with signaling and information. So beautiful stuff. Yeah, I agree that um, Ubik is also one of the more vicious corporate dystopias. Um, but of course, we can't forget that stigmata is also, you know, that, that you're talking about essentially, you know, an entire novel taking place within the crosshairs of a drug war, you know, uh, a competition between two different drug cartels over the bandwidth of, you know, millions of human minds. Uh, and then we have the kind of corporate dystopia of the struggle over the bandwidth of the human mind in Duran Drake's Doom of Electric Sheep. And then we have the struggle over the bandwidth of the human mind in Ubik. And I really think he was, he seemed to constantly be playing with this idea of what happens when all of experience become com com becomes commodified. What happens when even the nature of our own thoughts becomes commodified? And, you know, Joe Chip not being able to get out of his apartment for want of a quarter, uh, of course, you know, kind of sums that up in a kind of every man way that, you know, each moment of Joe Chip's life has become commodified in this way. And, you know, that is the domain that we're being, you know, encouraged to dwell within where, you know, the best way to deal with every aspect of a life is to divide it up into kind of commodity experiences of one sort or another. Um, and I think that, you know, PKD was prescient about that. And if I remember correctly, he enjoyed the Peter Fitting essay from 1975, which is a kind of Marxist analysis, even though he was not friendly to the, uh, um, you know, in some ways was not, you know, so keen on the Marxist analysis of his own work. If I remember correctly, and I might be wrong here, I might be subject to entropy. He, he kind of, in the exegesis, grudgingly admires this essay by Peter Fitting, who was a critic um, about Ubik as a sort of narrative about, uh, you know, capitalist uh, commodification of all experience. So yeah, dystopia, but within the dystopia, we're always about to evolve some sort of response and that we're on, en engaged in this ongoing war between entropy and negentropy. Yeah, Dan is also mentioning also the sense that these corporations are commoditizing, modifying the specific skills of evolved consciousness. So not even just oh, yeah. regular consciousness, but the psychics, you know, and, and the precogs and everything else. The creatives. Yeah. Like, you know, I mean, it, it's, it, it's a precursor to the whole idea of an economy of innovation, right? Like, what does that mean, right? It means we, we gather smart people together and try to you know, skim the creative cream off the top of whatever their creativity is uh, creating. And, you know, the kind of tension between the kind of culture that is conducive to creativity and then the kind of culture that want that seeks to commodify is you know something that is ongoing right you know that you know in, innovation is something that is both you know deeply hated by the corporate regime because it disrupts their already existing business model and that they're absolutely addicted to because they're constantly engaged in the need to disrupt each other's business model so this double attitude towards you know mad talents like being a precog or being a telepath or being a creative uh is you know characteristic of you know capitalist form yeah there's a, an interesting foreshadowing of the consciousness culture in mm. this idea that mm. there can be an economy of of uh, evolutionary psychic mutations can even become commodified and you know it's this oh, idea really? In will, yeah, in in the you nineteen know, seventies, the nineteen eighties, and onward, you know, um, there is a certain need for survivability within capitalism, but also there's a commodification of 
you know, uh, the kind of Esalen breaking new grounds, consciousness culture, counterculture, which becomes now kind of a, a product to be sold, you know, a, a yoga to be purchased and that kind of thing. So it's or sort even, of thing. Or, or even where, where many of these technologies come from, which of course, you know, they come from, many of them come from psychedelic experience. You know, we need, need only mention, you know, the role that Steve Jobs played in the construction of this, you know, info landscape that we're in. And the fact that, you know, during a certain period of the 1970s, he seems to have taken more LSD than Timothy Leary. Or Carrie Mullis, uh, you know, a Nobel Prize winning biologist, um, invented polymerase chain reaction while he was a dishwasher at uh, Buttercup Bakery in Berkeley because he was out of a job from his biotech company and, you know, took LSD in uh, his um, Mendocino County cabin and wrote equations all over the interior of the cabin and came up with basically the technology which spurred the biotechnology revolution, which was so simple in its principle and in, in its practice that when people saw what he had done, they kind of smacked themselves in the forehead because it was so evident that, you know, once you see it, you see that it is so. Um, so a lot of these technologies that, you know, are associated with, you know, the rapid innovation of technological culture themselves have their roots in the culture of psychedelia and in psychedelic experience. So consciousness culture, you know, John Perry Barlow just passed, I think a couple of days ago, you know, early kind of internet pioneer associated with uh, information technology ideas. Uh, you know, if w once you start to look at, uh, you know, Mitch Kapoor, who invented the spreadsheet of all things, uh, you know, what, what could be a more counter psychedelic thing than a spreadsheet, Mitch Kapoor credits his experiences with psychedelics as giving him this kind of insight into the uh, possibility of creating something like a spreadsheet, which he then created for Lotus. Um, Wozniak and Jobs, you know, as I mentioned, uh, what the Dormouse said by uh, John, I should know his name, but I don't, writes about that. I wrote a kind of scholarly piece on this in 2002 called Consciousness Expansion and Biotechnology uh, in America, tracing out the deep link between consciousness culture and then the culture of technology that comes out of it. So we ought not be surprised that people that cultivate some kind of a relationship to the logos are going to be kind of in better a better place to um, cultivate technologies of the logos, you know, than people who are not. But um, I do think you know this double this double experience is an important one. Shall we go to some text, or is there uh, one Let's more? Let's do it. Uh, Let's sorry? do it. Yeah. No, it, we should probably move on to some text. Uh, yeah, we'll yeah. Because I, I just think listening to this, it is all there in Ubik. If I could but exegete. Right, you know, that then maybe we could just do a little bit of exegesis on Ubik. Yes, exactly. Tech workers, microdosing LSD, commodification of precog. No doubt. No doubt. Um, but whether the commodification is complete, I think, is really the story here. Um, ah, yes. So uh, I, I personally always, every time I read the opening pages of Ubik, uh, I'll admit to finding them funny in a kind of slapstick way. Um, and I just wanted to point out something here uh, where Dick is in the first two pages already pointing to the falsehood of the novel itself. He's asking us to both read the novel and know that it's fake at the same time, right? In the same way he says, uh, you know, that, we, that he's trying to encourage us to see that our own collective environment is just a pseudo reality. Right, which is very interesting because most of the time, right, a novelist will engage what uh, you know Samuel Coleridge called he, he asking us to engage in the suspension of disbelief, to you know, put aside our you know resistance to believing what's going on in this world. Whereas Dick is both engaging our suspension of disbelief and then kind of pointing, almost like in a fourth wall kind of way, at the fact that you know we're we're engaged in the ongoing belief in something that is totally fake. Um, so, uh, first page, you know, S. Dole Melipone has, uh, disappeared and sleepily, this is the very first page, Runciter graded, 
and I think it's always interesting to hear how boy, how Runster's voice is described. Who I can't keep in mind at all times, which inertials are following what teep or precog. With his hand, he smoothed down his rough gray mass of wire-like hair. Remember, we talked last time about the way in which PKD is often making his characters so that they seem to have machine-like characteristics and living-like characteristics at the same time. So his voice is grating, and he's got wire-like hair. Skip the rest and tell me which of Hollis's people is missing now. Esto Melopone, the technician said. What? Melopone's gone? You kid me. Next page. I not kid you. And it's in that response, I not kid you, which we have on the screen here, which is kind of pointing to the fact that the technician is just parroting what Glenn Runstetter is saying. It says like, no, I'm not kidding you would be the normal uh, response. But he's just repeating back. He's just miming, replicating back uh, in this way. And then further on down, just in case we don't get the joke, you know, pointing out the stilted nature of this uh, reality. We asked Joe Chip to go in and run tests on the magnitude and magnitude of the field being generated there at the Bonds of Erotic Polymorphic Experience Motel. Chip says it registered at its height 68.2 blurry units of telepathic aura, which only Melopone among all the known telepaths can produce. The technician finished. So that's where we stuck Melopone's identiflag on the map. And now he, it, is gone. Did you look on the floor behind the map? It's gone electronically. The man it represents is no longer on Earth. Now, of course, Runciner here is kind of playing a straight man where he's saying, oh, well, he's confusing literally, and PKD would have been aware of this, the map and the territory. He's making this conflation that the uh, uh, Alfred Korzybski, who wrote a wonderful book called Science and Sanity, talked about the difference between the map and the territory. And he's kind of doing in this deadpan way, making Brunstetter mistake the map for the territory because it doesn't matter whether the pin disappears, right? Did you look on the floor behind the map? The problem is, of course, what the symbol symbolizes. But here we have an instance where the main character that we've been introduced to so far is confused about the thing that is symbolized and the symbol itself. And he's, PKD is going to play with that the whole novel where we're going to constantly get confused about what's being symbolized, i.e. what's happening in the world of the novel and what's happening outside the world, the symbol itself and what's happening that the symbol is pointing to. So this kind of confusion can allow us to sort of, uh, so I think the next one that you have there is uh, page 36 of the um, uh, Vantage edition, uh, Jeremy. And uh, yes, and it's uh, talking about a commercial that Runcetter associates with uh, Run, which was designed to create this kind of demand for their services. And he says, um, uh, talking about seeing how this is probably so, perhaps we should stress one of our business establishment commercials. Do you perhaps recall this one, Mr. Runcetter? It shows a husband home from his job at the end of the day. Okay, so we have a kind of cliched treatment of almost a kind of 1950s commercial here, right? He still has on his electric yellow cummerbund pedal skirt, knee-hugging hose, and military-style military visored cap. He seats himself wearily on the living room couch. Okay, now we're back to the kind of cliched 50s domain, even though we just had the interruption of an electric yellow cummerbund, pedal skirt, knee-hugging hose, and military-style visored cap. And he seats himself wearily on the living room couch, starts to take off one of his gauntlets, then hunches over, frowns, and says, gosh, Jill, I wish I knew what's been wrong with me lately. Sometimes with greater frequency almost every day, the least little remark at the office makes me think that, well, somebody's reading my mind. And it's this juxtaposition between the total cliche of the kind of 50s, 60s, you know, man coming home from work at the end of a long day at the office and the electric yellow cummerbund pedal skirt, knee-hugging hose, and military-styled visored cap, not to mention gauntlets, that puts us, I think, in this kind of oscillation between a world that we readily recognize and one that is totally bizarre. And I really lit up on this, 
maybe the fifth or sixth time I read this book. And it's because I had the opportunity to be um, in, at Cal State Fullerton in, uh, in Southern California, back when uh, PKD's papers were located there. And I was looking through the papers one day and I had an aha moment because I found this single page that had things written on it like electric yellow cummerbund, snood, pedal pusher, so forth. And it was the list of all of the outlandish garbs that the characters were going to be uh, wearing in throughout the pages of Ubik. And he had page numbers that corresponded to the manuscript where all the things were. So this was very much a kind of, you know, conscious design feature of the book. And if we pause on it, we can see that, first of all, probably, I would wager, a lot of you didn't notice that Herbert von uh, Fogelsang, Schoenheit von Fogelsang, was wearing a beanie, right, when he shows up. Uh, that we, we are observing the fact that a great deal of the time in our reading experience, we jump over a lot of the details of the, uh, for example, the clothing that a character is, is wearing. But throughout here, the kind of sheer uh, strangeness of the garb, you know, is always there. We're always about to notice it. And if, and if you notice it every time, you know, like, cool. But I think that, the, 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 that what it's trying to do rhetorically, because PKD was very, you know, canny, just says, you know, Van Gogh knows how to do things with, you know, yellow paint. And with the, you know, with brushwork, PKD knows how to do something by just taking a tradition, a, a, a persistent line on coming up with uh, uh, outfits that we then don't notice. So over on the um, uh, next page, Miss Word is waiting, says, Miss Runc Mr. Runciter is free, Miss Word. His secretary tottered to one side and a plump woman rolled into the office. Her head, like a basketball, bobbed, bobbled up and down. Her great round body propelled itself toward a chair, and there at once she seated herself, narrow legs dangling. She wore an unfashionable spider silk coat, looking like some amiable bug wound up in a cocoon not spun by itself. She looked encased. However, she smiled, right? So we have this juxtaposition between these sort of familiar tropes it's almost like word is somebody waiting for a detective in a film noir office you know in a detective office but then she you know she has a head like a basketball that bobbles up and down and she's wearing a spider silk coat that probably many of us did not uh notice so it's that kind of even just paying attention to the the outlandish garb that these people are wearing can kind of give us a clue about how it is that we're both being invited into a very familiar world and also, you know, being tuned into what is essentially a kind of psychedelic or the very least almost like Dr. Seuss world, where even though many things seem exactly very similar and the same, it's a non-referential world where nothing recognizable whatsoever is being worn by anyone uh, in the book. So um, to me, that's a kind of, again, just a tactic that, you know, we might be able to make sense of. And then by learning to focus our attention in on, you know, what these little tactics are, we can actually, you know, kind of engage the ultra metacognition a little bit more. It's like, oh, Dick was metaprogramming my, programming my mind towards this state where I both noticed the effect of this text on me. So I noticed the increased amount of entropy in the world that I'm living in. And I don't notice, at times anyway, the sort of snoods and the pedal pushers and the pedal skirts and the gauntlets. Um, so I'm curious, actually, how much people noticed the uh, outlandish garb in the book. And if I was the only numbskull that had to find a page in the archives to really notice it, like, this is a pretty consistent and serious strategy that's worth thinking about and reflecting on. Yeah, Dan was mentioning um, 
right at the beginning, actually, his first question was, uh, Ubik seems unusual in the detailed descriptions of the weird fashion styles, maybe contrasting the internal and external qualities of the characters. Exactly. And it's sort of what you're saying, too, about the juxtaposition of, okay, this is a normal noir setting, but oh my God, the description of that woman, it's, it's so otherworldly. And then it ends with the smile and it kind of, it takes you, it stretches as if you're on some kind of psychedelic. It really is. Being this woman, in this other dimensional way, and then she smiles and it brings you back to the, the human dimension. Um, and then he's also mentioning that uh, there's a reference to dancing the frug in one of the Ubik ads. And I was, I remember that too. I was like, what is the frug? There must be some something in this world. I don't know. <laughs> what's a frug uh yeah i mean it's fun to just play bibliomancy actually uh oh tessa's saying the frug is a is a 60s dance arms oh, wave wildly oh that's so funny it's 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 sort of weird with the distance from the book the past becomes some kind of strange future and i was just imagining he made it up um well, I'm just I'm just pursuing different Ubik commercials right now because that's what I'm usually left with. It's just the love of the commercials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 you know, it's as if the whole book at times exists for the commercials. Um, that's just like saying that uh, her mom wouldn't let her dance the frug because it looks sexual. <laughs> what doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> um, and of course, you know, this is commenting on the sort of decreasing reality quotient of the world that again is the dick was very prescient of but so was it it's almost reminiscent of a kind of mad magazine take on the world in the late 60s early 70s where the sheer shock of this new artificial commercial um uh framework where you're being fed these lies all day you know, like pop tasty Ubik, Ubik into your toaster made only from fresh fruit and healthful all vegetable shortening. Ubik makes breakfast a feast, put zing into your thing. Safe when handled as directed. You know, it's basically the animated Pop-Tart commercials I saw growing up when Milton the toaster, there was a character that was a toaster. Um, uh, you know, it was a very Phil Dickian character if you think about it. And, you know, at this point in time, you know, it's still a shock that there's actually a whole domain of reality that is devoted entirely to more or less lying to you nonstop. And Dick is playing with the fact that we're involved in this constant feed of these lies. And then there's always the menace, right, of safe, you know, safe only when taken as directed. You know, that there's both this promise of radical safety and security and this threat that kind of always lingers underneath kind of the, the product. So, you know, that's, that's, that's kind of where I am for the week in the sense that like lots of entropy. And, and, and I think one of the things that's important to do with you because to not try to make sense of it, to be honest with you, uh, you know, oftentimes when I teach this in the classroom setting, people want to know what the, what the end means you know, and, and I think, you know, what the uh, end means is that it's undecidable, you know, that uh, we need to grapple with this space of not knowing and that we're deeply uncomfortable with this space about not knowing. But the more we fathom that space of not no knowing, the more we you know, can enter into ultra metacognition because by not knowing, we're able to just observe and not try to figure out everything that is happening in the novel. We can just observe and not try to figure out everything that is happening in our lives. And by observing it, we can see patterns that aren't at the same level of the narrative itself, right? In other words, it's not at the same level of the narrative itself to say, look, it's undecidable who is in cold pack and who's not. There's no definitive answer to who's in cold pack and, and who is not. Dick himself is writing uh, in part in the exegesis, trying to understand the book he himself wrote. In that sense, he's a lot like um, Hawthorne Abbotson in Man in the High Castle, a book we haven't read and maybe won't read this time, but is has this same principle that, you know, 
what what is real is the reality that the characters are living in real or is the reality that's portrayed in the book the grasshopper lies heavy uh real and that kind of undecidability haunts hawthorne abbotson who's the author uh, of the grasshopper lies heavy in the book where he he struggles with the fact that he'd written something using the i ching and yet it's true and he's confronted by this at the end that he doesn't know what to make of the fact that this work of fiction that he's written is true. And from what I've seen about Dick's reflections of the end of uh, The Man in the High Castle, he himself was uncomfortable with that sort of undecidable characteristic. And I think that there's that deep sense of discomfort with that at the end of Ubik as well, which is there is no resolution, which some people find very deeply dissatisfying uh, because they, they want there to be some sort of resolution. But I, I would encourage you to experiment with just the idea of being able to experience that neither one, one nor the other is true and that it's a book and that what you know, Dick is offering you is a layout to occupy a certain kind of fantasy world and that you live in that fantasy world and it makes you look back at your own world in a different way. Yeah, Tessa's mentioning that um, Phil couldn't figure out how to end Ubik, so he left it open. And he also mentions uh, that um, yep. he, Hallborn, uh, Hawthorne Abinson is based on Robert Heinlein. Nice. So, Did not know yeah. that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, there's there's another dimension of the book, I mean, that I've noticed scanning it this week, um, which was interesting, is that the ads themselves, the Ubik ads at the beginning of every chapter, they're directed at you. They're kind of interjections in the narrative yeah. and they're directed at you. And as you are going through this experience being Joe Chip, not sure if you're alive or dead anymore or in Half-Life, and you notice that the Ubik ads are, the Ubik ads appear to the people who are in Half-Life, right? Mm -hmm. So you start to kind of go, wait, why is Ubik addressing me? Am I in Half-Life? Like, <laughs> what's going on here? There's a little bit of vertigo, that I think, and disorientation that happens through encountering these Ubik ads in a kind of repetitive way so that like by the fifth or sixth one, you start, your own mind starts to kind of get that question, right? You're a little bit less comfortable just reading a book. It's not just a book anymore. Yeah. Right. Well, and because it forces this query, am I in half-life? What is half-life? Right. And I, you know, I think one of the feelings that we get when we read Ubik or we read Three Stigmata, we read, when there's like electric sheep is that we in fact are in half-life that um you know there's the um the in the exegesis pkd writes about the black iron prison and the palm garden right that there is you know the eternity of springtime there is there's ubic and then there is you know the mechanical world grinding on there is what he calls zebra and there is the Urgrund, the Urgrund being that space of pure consciousness uh, and, and zebra being the, the world of mechanical causality. And as long as we identify with the world of mechanical causality from the perspective of you know, most of the exegesis, then we are in fact in half-life, that we're living a kind of uh, you know, robotic zombie half-life cold pack existence. Um, but that if we uh, identify not with the realm of mechanical causality and linear time, but experience the eternal present moment in, you know, the blitz of the now, then we're, we, we wake up out of half-life. We're not in, 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 enthralled by half-life. We can, in fact, transcend half-life just as Ubik can transcend it. Uh, half life. So, I did. I think we ought to take that challenge of you know the the challenge of reading the book of Ubik to take very seriously that yes we are um, in half life, but in an Augenblick, in the blink of an eye, we can indeed perceive the fact that we are not this half life, that we transcend this half life, and in that you know Augenblick, in that blink of an eye you know, we can have something like a metanoia. We don't have to have a 2374, but we can perceive that there's a way of rejecting the, the pseudo reality of our environment and living 
according to uh, principles of a word that comes up a lot in the exegesis, which is agape, which is respecting in a selfless way the being, the eni of the other, the being of the other. And that, you know, that this has implications for the kind of empathy that we feel for each other and the kind of uh, planet that we live on together, the kind of hovelists that we are. That it's not purely a intellectual or cognitive game that this desire to understand the nature of reality on PKD's part was existential. He seemed to want to understand how to live uh, in this reality and that we begin to live when we no longer fall for the pseudo reality that we have taken to be real. And that, you know, reading Ubik can help us kind of notice that what we took to be the permanent reality of the environment is in fact constantly subject to degradation and decay and that we better find something in you know the blink of an eye that is not and that that something is you know i would say at least at different points in the exegesis pkd points to as quote ultra metacognition where you know we become aware of that imminent mind that is operating within us Eric is mentioning that uh, Ubik or the delivery service of Ubik will always find us. That's reassuring. Oh, yeah. Because it is ubiquitous. <laughs> mm-hmm. It is literally, yes, as we become aware of our awareness, precisely. And, you know, it's easy enough, Pace Leo Bolero at the end of um, Three Sigmata, to forget. You know, we have to remember to remember. And, you know, these books are good mnemonic devices for us remembering to remember, remembering our awareness. And when we begin to become aware of our awareness, then we're no longer living in half-life. Hmm. Well, I think if, uh, let's see, it's 9.06. So we've gone about a little over 90 minutes. Um, so if anybody has any last minute questions, any, any closing thoughts, any closing experiences perhaps, um, because this book in particular is a very synchronous, synchronous inducing literary experience, especially. And it was like that for me this year, as Rich, you know, as we were talking yes. about these experiences, of just sort of driving around Florida and um, being in the kind of new St. Petersburg and turning a corner and then seeing a, a 50, 60, 70 year old building. And that kind of psychogeography was just mapping completely with the book. So quite intense experiences, but um, yeah, Gurdjieff, Ospensky, remember yourself. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Oh, um, the, the paper you mentioned about Ubik. Sorry? Um, Warren's asking near the beginning, you mentioned a paper you wrote about Ubik. It's mostly about uh, uh, the exegesis and cosmogony and cosmology as a synthesis of the exegesis, but it, it takes Ubik into account. Uh, so I'm happy to share it as a PDF with the group. It's supposed to go in some collection of essays, but that takes forever. So, and you know, make of it whatever you like. Um, but it's, it's trying to understand how it is that uh, PKD could be that offering something like wisdom, which I would take him to be doing. And even while, you know, a lot of mainstream reality looks at the exegesis as something that is to be diagnosed. So I'm kind of looking at, you know, why is the exegesis sort of shunted the shot to the side besides the usual answer of just how long it is. And, you know, the suggestion is, is because we don't, well, I'll just let it, I'll let it sit there, but Ubik is is prominent in as well, but you know, just, you could do control G or control F and find Ubik in there. Mm. if You're interested. So a few wrap up questions. Uh, Joe Joseph is asking, did the exegesis talk about the perennial philosophy directly? Mm, Not in those words. Um, But when he's using Spinoza, Bohm, uh, um, Plotinus all directly, he's basically sketching his own alternative framework of the perennial philosophy and one that is really even more experiential, I think, than Huxley's. I think it's interesting that it's our novelists who are noting, noticing the patterns in the global spiritual traditions. And Huxley was sort of 
pointing to the common patterns at play in different uh, religious traditions. But what's fascinating about the um, exegesis is that this it's personal. In other words, he himself is navigating the ins and outs of the perennial philosophy. And so that's why I feel comfortable uh, calling him a perennial philosopher, because he's finding the common basis, the, the single indescribable fact, you know, in Shankara, in Vedanta, in Buddhism, in Taoism, in Plotinus, the uh, Platon, Neoplatonic philosopher, in Hegel, in Heidegger, uh, in Burroughs. You know, he's, he's, he's bringing together all these, a lot of these thinkers, and many, many more, of course. And so we either have to say, oh, well, gosh, that's a fragmented mess of references. Or we say, no, look, look how he's sewing all of these references together through this experience, trying to comprehend the uh, encounter with, you know, what he'll label Vallis or Zebra or F Firebright. Hmm. Yeah, there's just some chat now just about the, the film, which is apparently in question. Um. I personally think that a Ubik movie would be great, but maybe an HBO series would be a little bit better to really kind of build that world and live in it for, you know, 10 episodes or so. Yeah, it looks like it may not be. Uh... Well, I hope it's adapted. I mean, there's more of a chance these days than, than not. Stigmata, too, I mean, is dying to be a movie. I mean, oh my gosh. Get, get <laughs> Richard Linklater to do what he did in Scanner Darkly and do it with Three Stigmata. I mean, you know, my own personal favorite idea for a movie would be a Martian Time Slip because it's a kind of little noir movie almost that you could do. And you could do it very like on a modest budget and you could film this kind of beautiful, uh, um, you know, pathos driven. It's, it, to me, it's the novel besides Dwayne Dory's Dream of Electric that has the most pathos in it. So it might be more cinematic. Uh, to me, there's always this temptation. I'm, I'd be interested to know why they dropped Ubik because sometimes I feel like, and I haven't seen, I still haven't seen 2049. There's a kind of gee whiz aspect to what we want to do with, like the, I saw the first episode of the Electric Dreams series and I thought that that's like, it, again, I've understood, I, I understand that it has gotten like more interesting, but it doesn't seem to get the depth of what's going on in PKD to me. I love Man in the High Castle, but it's not very Phil Dickian, I wouldn't say. Uh, um, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a good use of the narrative. But to me, the shift from Grasshopper Lies Heavy being a book to Grasshopper Lies Heavy being films kind of does the whole thing, right? That it, it doesn't realize that um, a lot of what's happening in these worlds is the way in which worlds are manipulated by text, by the I Ching, right, by the, the book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy, by the author, Hawthorne Abinson, which we now know as, we now grok, is based on Robert Heinlein. So, uh, you know, it's beautiful. But, and I also thought that unlike the book, Man in the High Castle, there's a, there's, there's a there's periodically distressing relationship to the Showa in Man in the High Castle uh, as, a, as, a, um, as a series. It's almost like, we're meant to sort of enjoy how evil the the Nazis are, where there's there's no enjoyment of how evil the Nazis are in the book. You know, there's there's no complicity with the Nazis in the book. So, and I, I'm not accusing the series of complicity. I'm just saying it's playing that that area where we're meant to kind of be thrilled at the horror that we have at these things. So. Yeah, there was there was a weird um, issue when it first came out. Uh, a, su a subway car was filled with uh, Men in the High Castle posters, mm. and there were SWAT stickers in the in the Ooh. poster. Ooh. And you know, people were t you know Jewish New Yorkers were t yeah. taking the subway, going, "What the hell is this?" Yeah. So they kind of it kind of backfired um, in, in a way that I, I you know they're playing with material that it, you know yeah. Philip Dick was much more serious with. Yes. So yeah, that, that kind of had that. And, and I'm not trying to finger wag or anything. I'm just saying that Dick does such a nice job with it. <laughs> yeah. That it, it's, it's difficult. Um, 
but you know, but then you know, in their defense, there was that whole thing where people were reading the fake uh, Twitter feed from uh, Man in the High Castle, and uh, you know, and they thought that it was an anti-Trump screed, which is almost too perfect, you know. Yeah, that that was great. So yeah, it was very a very interesting time, and then with with Trump getting elected, and um, uh, a lot of journalists sort of suddenly taking up the book. And kind of going, we need to read this. We need to yeah. be aware. And you know, this is po- like we can slip into an alternate reality. So it was kind of an interesting, again, you know, like the Philip K. Dick's books playing with the future. Like he just seems to come up and be relevant and uh, happen parallel with con- converge with us again and again. And I think he's pointing to the way in which this is always happening. You know what I mean? That he, he just points to the fact that he's doing it. Uh, but, you know, we're always involved in these feedback loops with these textual universes that we inhabit. That's why the map is not, that's why it's important to remember that the map is not the territory, right? That we end up living in these universes that are created by text, but the universe is not text. Like, we, we end up living in these stories we tell about the universe rather than the universe, and that's, you know, more or less awakening in a nutshell. Live in the universe. Don't live in your story about the universe. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, Joe's just mentioning uh, that The Embrace of the Perennialist by Rene Guinan by alt writers uh, seems perfectly Dickian, kind of a strange inversion. Interesting. Yeah, I heard about that a little bit, just sort of the co opting of tradition by alt right these days. Um, so that's a whole thing. That's a whole other topic, uh, rabbit hole. Um, so maybe. Maybe it'd be good to go over. So, what are we reading next week? What's our homework? Who knows? What you know? What's what's on there? What's the syllabus say? You know, like um, let's feel it. I'm not even gonna look. Uh, let's feel it. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, we didn't order in Divine Invasion, right? No. Uh, Scanner Darkly. We, Scanner Darkly is the next one officially. Yeah. Feels like Scanner Darkly is right, actually, right All now. Right. Techno metanoia uh, or pulled yeah. through infinity is Scanner Darkly. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, I look forward to all of them, but uh, I think Scanner Darkly works well with where we've ended up today uh, in terms of this uh, competition for the bandwidth of our mind. And then it starts to get individualized in the person of Bob Arctor slash Fred. And, um, you know, this in, in, uh, that and the kind of limits of ultra metacognition of, you know, Bob slash Fred watching tapes of himself, putting him, putting himself under surveillance. It's really a great little and very tight exploration of, you know, where we have to go in ultra metacognition and ultra metacognition being based on and, and yielding empathy, right? That I would point to in advance as you read the book the moments when uh, Bob is supercharging Donna with his hash pipe as this kind of like state of, of wholeness that is being pointed to. And I would also point to the statement, you know, if we knew it was harmless, if I knew it were harmless, I would have killed it myself, which is a reaction by a neighbor to a spider. Um, and it points again to the, remember the spider, and it points again to this kind of perception of a world where there's part of the world that doesn't seem to be noticing that there are such things as living things <laughs> and that they're distinct from machines. And that Bob Arctor finds himself, slash Fred, finds himself at this nexus between these living things, these little blue flowers, and the surveillance networks of holotapes, which are you know, observing the distribution of the results of those little flowers. So really a beautiful book. And uh, I guess it's the afterword, right, where he writes about uh, the experiences that the uh, book came out of. And I would, I would encourage people to read that, you know, it's like for people who were punished too much uh, for playing. And uh, we'll do that one next week. And I'm really looking forward to it. And guess who shows up right in the middle of Scanner Darkly. Tayard. Does he? I d- In- wow. Inexplicably, uh, there's a speech when they're working on the car uh, 
where the unmistakable oneness of man is opined where somebody's reading from Teilhard de Jardin right in the middle of Scanner Darkly. So oh, I love um, it. <laughs> we will focus on that a little bit next time. So because we're summoning all these 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 allies, right? We're summoning Aurobindo, we're summoning Gebster, we're, we're we're summoning Teilhard to saying, hey, help join in this project where we're kind of trying to potentiate PKD's works again not for the commodity form which is fine that it goes on there we hope people make a lot of money of that but for the wisdom that he was trying to share with us that more or less can't be commodified um so good that said you know whatever people can give to donation for uh nora is a good thing because you know we want to try to you know just keep things like this going and um you know and again that's 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 not a commercial from ubic it's just a saying like, hey, you know, don't give, give, it's all good. Um, but we can just pause to thank Jeremy for doing this and putting this together. And each week I feel like there's a kind of deeper dialogue. So I'm full of uh, gratitude for that. And we'll be in touch during the week. Beautiful, thank you, Rich. I uh, really appreciate it. And I'm uh, looking forward to next week. And yep, Nura, safe when used as directed. Thanks, Max. Yeah, sure. That's great. <laughs> and even, okay, everybody. It's actually, it's never safe, to be honest with you. <laughs> so. That's the lie, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, friends. I really All appreciate right. this. Once again, energized. Onward. Yes. Onward, indeed. Okay, take care, Rich. Take care, everybody. Right. Have a great week. And Talk to you in a few days, Jeremy. In. Perfect, yep. yep. Okay, bye, everybody.